Hello and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a black sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Liz. This is big, big episode, Daphne. <laughs> oh my god. Yep. Oh. Yep. This is uh, kind of the episode of Black Sales that shook the world of Black Sales. That shook the world. Yeah. I yep. did not see this coming, frankly. No. I I I would be amazed if anyone did see it coming to be honest. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, well, we'll get to that part. I am actually saving that to the very end uh, in our schedule. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll discuss, we'll discuss what our experience was when we first watched it. But yeah, it's, it's huge. And um, I remember that this was a very controversial es- episode when it came out. Yes. For me, this was an episode that Honestly, as you know, as sad as I was to lose Vane, and as Mm -hmm. you know, which was very sad, obviously. um, I yeah, this was an episode where I was just like, "Damn, this is a this is an amazing story." It's an amazing story, yeah, and and yeah, this is the way it had to go. Yeah, there, this was the only way to begin it, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Mm. so this is a big deal. It's been. yeah, these two episodes, this one and the season finale, are yeah, just... Yeah, we were talking earlier about how they really almost feel like a two-parter. They do. They do very much. Yeah. I really think so. So we're going we're gonna to work really hard, everyone, for especially for our first-time watchers, to right. not talk about them that way, as tempting yes. as it will be. We can always go back to talking about this episode once we're talking about the next one. Yes, sure. exactly. Uh, yes, I have a feeling I might finish recording and just go watch episode ten because today when wow. I when I rewatched nine, I was like, can I can can can't I just go watch ten now? I love it. Yeah, it is my favorite. I th- I I um for purposes that will come up later in the podcast, I re listened to our coverage of the season finale of season two. Yes. And uh-huh. I re- I said in that, I was like, I'm not really sure if this is my favorite episode or if the season finale of season three is my favorite episode. Yep. It is 100% the <laughs> season finale of season three. I'm so uh-huh. excited. I've kept myself from watching it now since we've been covering yeah. season three. And I'm so excited to get be able to watch it, it again. It's a great episode. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that as well. So yeah. So that's in our wonderful future. But in our present we have this episode so maybe we should just get yeah. started let's go ahead yeah let's get to it Sail! okay so i think we have the same groupings as last week uh we have the walrus crew and um the island and the village and, right. the island. and in nasa we have two groups one is is the grouping of you know basically Max and Eleanor and Rogers, mostly yes. Eleanor this time, obviously. Yeah, lots of Eleanor. And then we have our our pirate conspiracy. Well, and we have Vane, who is, I guess, part of the. I don't want to call that's, him part of the true. Eleanor part, but he is. Yeah, of, yeah. Vane, yeah, Vane has his Eleanor own story, story. obviously. Mm-hmm. Yes, oh, he does. Our oh, dear geez. Vane. And I'm going to flip it. We usually end with the walrus. I'm going to start with the walrus this time. I think. We'll, wow. Yeah, we're going to start with okay. the walrus crew. The walrus story and the Nassau story are both huge. Yes. Huge, this episode. And I know that that Vane's death really ended up eclipsing a lot of things in this episode that are also amazing things. Um, but I do think just thematically it's appropriate to end with, with Vane. Sure. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think it's the only way to do it. Right. So, yeah, it's not to say I some of my favorite walrus stuff is in this episode but we should start with that so that we can end with Vane because Vane okay Vane's Vane's death is really what launches the next episode in a lot of ways yeah yeah you're right about that uh okay so yeah uh let's uh let's get started talking about our characters okay prepare to board Hi. okay well I was gonna start with uh with Jack and Flint um we don't get a lot of Jack when we get a we don't get a whole microscopic lot of yeah. bit of Anne. Um, yeah, for sure. I do feel like it's significant that that Jack is essentially a frame in this episode. We get Jack oh, at the very sure. start, uh huh, and we get Jack at the very end. And I feel mm-hmm. like 
without trying to spoil anything, and of course we don't know anything about season four, but I feel like having Jack be a frame is significant to this being a sort of shift. This is my prediction, I guess. This is my season four Mm -hmm. prediction, is that this, this, uh, that basically Jack is framing the Flint and Silver stuff feels like Jack is repositioning himself. I mean, obviously, because he says, I will be our Charles Vane. Uh-huh. So Jack is repositioning himself. Jack is very significantly different in this episode than we've ever seen him. He is. It's so true. Uh, so that's my prediction. I mean, we 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 both know what will be in the next episode, but I mm-hmm. feel like this maybe we'll have some significance, um, weighty, weighty significance perhaps for season yeah. four. <laughs> All of my fears may come true. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we start, we start the episode with uh, Flint coming to visit Jack and, 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 and the cash. Yes. Mm-hmm. The key to which has been thrown overboard. Yes. Which I suppose really is the only thing that you can do. I think that was the right choice, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I think it was the right choice um, strategically, but it was also the right choice symbolically. Mm, yes. You mm-hmm. know, because he talks about what's in that cash isn't... Everything that's in the box. Exactly. Yeah. So it's almost like the only thing you could do is give the keys to a box that contains so many important things. Mm-hmm. The only thing you could do with the key to that box is to get rid of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah. And yeah, he just, he seems so haunted. We see so much here of his loyalty and his love and affection for Mm -hmm. Charles Vane. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And remember, we were talking about last week, Jack and Anne riding off. Mm Mm-hmm. And whether we thought that that was something they would actually do Mm -hmm. and and leaving Charles Vane behind. I think you're right. Haunted is the word. I think if I recall, he doesn't actually express regret for having left him behind. But you can sense that he feels it very deeply. Absolutely. Yes, you can. Mm. You can totally sense it. And and that that ties into his same his sense of self, because he talks about if Charles dies, then his good name is also is also lost. Mm. And he also, he brings, he brings up Gates. Yeah. He really, I mean, he's just, yeah, you can just feel that he is feeling the weight of everything right now. Mm-hmm. He also says Anne's lost love. Anne's lost love. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful speech about the, about the, the box, he says, yeah. is what he calls right. it, right? The box. Yes. He doesn't call it the cash. Yeah. Or the chest, even. Yeah. You know, box right. is such a... An oh. interesting word. I wonder if it was harkening to Pandora's box or oh, what? What do you or, gasping? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gasping. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> or a coffin. Oh, interesting. Okay. Sorry, everyone, that I brought that into it. <laughs> 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 Just occurred to me suddenly. Um, <laughs> and he called them sacred things also. Yes. That's a beautiful expression of... Of who Jack is, that the things that mm-hmm. are sacred to him are relationships, are yes. honor and the relationships people have with each other. Mm-hmm. That just seems so appropriate for him to call that sacred. Yeah, I like that very much. Also, Anne, did you notice that we don't see her face until the very end? When Flint's there, she's like, I just, I so noticed I it. I did know like, it was back to old Anne. Yeah, right. she had the hat down and the hair in front of her right. face. Right, she yeah. was scowling, but she, bur- she, she was hidden. She was scowling. She was hidden until Flint leaves, and then she and Jack look at each other. Like, then she looks yeah. up and you really see part of her face, not all of it, but mm-hmm. but she, but she, yeah, she's, she's engaged again. Yes. At the very end. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, she was very much in the background of that mm-hmm. scene. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, yes. So we have that frame. And then on the flip side of it, we have Jack talking strategy with Flint and offering himself up to do the job that he knew Flint had planned for Charles to do. That That is the next time we see Jack. Gosh, that's all we get. It is a frame. Yeah. And that is a big switch. Yeah. What do you think about Jack being there, Charles Vane? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying really hard. It's okay. Trying really hard to talk about it without knowing what I know for the next episode. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, we don't know anything. And right. I, for one, don't remember very much right. at all. So I remember Jack's right. first day of pirate captain school. Right. And <laughs> his trouble with the fort. Right. And it just seems 
but an unlikely but uh-huh. but remember that when they were talking about about defending nasa he was the one who came up with the idea about what to do about ships and how to use the warship like the strategy is all there in his head mm-hmm. to be to be a captain yes Yes. To like tell troops what to do or plan a good plan. Right. If it was a game of risk or chess, right. he'd be great at it. Exactly. It's the actual leadership aspect. But the way he describes the situation, I mean, he's saying basically to Flint, like this force that's about to come down on us is a huge force. Mm-hmm. And they just have the one ship. I mean, it's basically sounds very much like he's like i understand the importance of the walrus and basically bugging that fleet of ships that's coming but it's kind of Mm -hmm. a suicide mission yeah the way he's describing it Mm -hmm. so i buy that i buy the idea that the haunted jack from the beginning of this episode is willing to do anything he can to Ah. be a part of this revenge i see Uh uh-huh because not only is he haunted, but it will certainly get his name in the history books. I I don't even know at this point if Jack's even thinking that way. I think I think I think that's always on Jack's really radar, okay. Though. That's yeah. probably true, and and certainly not that it's his primary motivation, but just that it's it might be like an unlikely end right. to but, Captain Jack Rackham, but have some poetry right. to it that he likes. Right, I can see him loving the poetry. I feel like it makes a lot of sense that all of this basically started like Vane is essentially had been captured because of Jack's foolishness about his name. Right? Like how Jack right. got captured because he went back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I feel like Jack may have reached a point here where he is actually willing to sacrifice everything. Like that he feels like mm. like maybe he feels like he he's the one who did this. He's the one who created this problem oh, that they have. Dear. Yeah. Uh I feel like there might be an element of that. I mean, I don't know. We don't um I don't have an answer to that. Mm-hmm. And he does seem a tiny bit gratified when Flint is finally giving him a captain to captain sort of nod, you know? Yes. But mm-hmm. I just, yeah, I just don't feel like in this episode, Jack's spending a lot of time, like he ties his name to the loss of Vane. Yeah. Okay. I, I just don't feel like he's in it for the glory right now. I don't mm-hmm. feel like that's his motivation. Again, yeah, I, that's that's just my sense. We've seen Jack downtrodden, but optimistic, right? We definitely mm-hmm. have seen that version of Jack. I mean, think about it. You know, when when they were the lowest of the low and he got pissed on all the time, he still yes. had some fight in him mm-hmm. for himself. Like he still had some right. sense that he could pick himself up again. Right. Mm-hmm. Pluck. Exactly. Mm-hmm. This does not strike me as pluck. Yeah. This is something I else. I mean, it I just something else. I feel yes. like this is a huge shift for Jack, like in such mm-hmm. so in so little screen time and so little of actual scenes in this episode i feel like we really are seeing a huge shift in jack's orientation i like that Mm -hmm. so yes we will discuss that more next episode because that's all we've got now now it's something i'll really be looking for so the next thing we have happens to be my absolute favorite ship scene in the whole series so far really yes this whole thing with the two anchors it's awesome, it's awesome, right? Isn't it so cool? <laughs> I actually so watched good. this one with Sarah Kate Vazant, so I also got the salt on Twitter. Oh, I'm really, I'm very, I'm very happy she saw it. <laughs> oh, she was really enthused. Yeah, it's... yeah, and of course I was. I kept on hollering and like, yes, and then I had apologized. She was like, "Stop apologizing! I geek out about shows all the time." Yeah, it was a great moment. It is so exhilarating. Like this is the one for me where I feel the way you feel about most of the ship moments like uh uh-huh. it's everything i would want at once it's the all the visceral stuff yes. about the ship mm-hmm. it's so about strategy which you know i love that it's stuff very strategic <laughs> yes <laughs> you know, absolutely you know i love yeah. that and it's down to the minute to the second right, even right yeah and it's 100 percent about character too i mean this is i think oh, the uh-huh. perfect example about how something can have action and exhilarating you know nail biting stakes yes. and at the same yes. time be at the at the same moment a completely minute and beautiful character moment i love when he says 
hard to port so casually like it's nothing. <laughs> right. Right. It's amazing. Right. And he's getting serious side eye from <laughs> <laughs> everyone. <laughs> everyone. Right. <laughs> yeah. But and just casual as asking for a cup of water. I know. I love Hard that to too. Port. Yeah. Right. Which oh, is so, so cool. significant after the conversation he just had with Silver. Yes. Uh, and uh, and it, let's take a moment to recognize the fact that Silver just last episode was talking about how he listens to what DeGroot says and then repeats it phonetically. Yes. Repeats it phonetically. Uh-huh. This was Silver's idea. Oh, yeah. This was Silver's idea. Oh, dear. No right. wonder he looks nervous. Exactly. And this is what mm-hmm. I know. Every bit of it. So I I wrote a lot of it down because, you know, me, because yeah. it's me. And well, and Black of course, Sales. he couldn't he couldn't call the timing in the way. No, no, of course did, not. But no, he but could he, did have the, he could theorize it. Yeah. Right. Which means he's seriously been studying. Yes, he has. Been, uh, obviously, he's been paying attention. Uh huh. Not yes. at all surprising for Silver. So, the, yeah, there's a bunch of things here. De Groot, of course, are doom and gloom. <laughs> De yes. Groot's very nervous about this plan. Although, again, I just can't help but like him. Mm-hmm. I, know. I know. So, yeah, DeGroote's very nervous. And then I love that, that Silver says, you know, I don't think he thinks this is a good idea. And then and then he turns to Flint and he's like, you you still think this is a good idea? Right. And Flint just gives him that little twitch, that little moment. Uh-huh. And Silver's like, fuck, are you serious? <laughs> and then yep. Flint says something really interesting. He said... He Silver said, but he's listening. And Flint says, well, it's either he thinks it's okay or that he doesn't know how to say no to the both of us at the same uh-huh. time. Yep. Partners. Which is great. Yeah. They are they're becoming partners. Absolutely. They are combining forces. Yes. They have reached which, that, epic, yeah. that epic place that we've been waiting for them to reach. Uh-huh. So... <laughs> So yeah, so so Flint says like, look, nobody had a better plan. I just yeah, Flint's very nonchalant here. He's very lovely and nonchalant. He is. It's insane, right? And I'm gonna have to say, I have to bring this back to the point I keep making. Like this was Silver's idea. This is Flint Mm -hmm. working with a partner, and suddenly we have nonchalant Flint. Like he's just he is. Oh, because you were saying he's better with partners. He's He's better with when he's when the when the crown is a little bit lighter. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna keep talking about this. So I apologize in advance. No, that's good. You're absolutely right. The crown is a little bit lighter. He's just more balanced. Mm Hmm. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. So Jagrut, of course, says you know things could be catastrophic while everyone's waiting. And then I love that when he says that it's Silver who says he knows. Like they are, they're totally working together. They're totally oh yeah tag teaming. They're yes, just they, they are. just they're uh-huh. working as a unit here. Mm-hmm. I mean, internally they're having their own conversation where Silver's like, "Oh my god, I'm freaking out." But uh-huh. but their outward facing version is the two of them, and it's the the visual also that you see the two of them standing on the holding onto the rail together, and they're just mm-hmm. you know it's like almost like co captains. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um. <laughs> So yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then it totally works. But oh my god, I know I I feel like I've made it's so exciting. I've made yeah. so many people watch the scene, even who don't watch Black Sails, because I'm like, no, no, you have to watch the scene and you have to listen it's to so all the exciting. noises and the two anchors, yes. and it's incredible. I wrote down nailed the dismount, and then I have one super long all caps. Yes. <laughs> It's amazing. It's an amazing scene. It's, it's an so amazing much. scene. It's just fun to watch. It is. It's exciting. It gets my heartbeat going. I mean, it's it's an exciting scene to right. watch. But again, it's also such an amazing view into where Flint and Silver are right then. Absolutely. I it love uh-huh. it. I love it. And also amazing strategy because and Hornigold mm-hmm. understands immediately. Yes. And then Hornigold's like plan B. And then he sees all those people on the beach and he's like, oh, shit, no plan B. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's awesome. Yep. It's it really awesome. fantastic. Oh, man. Yeah. And I had forgotten about that. And it was just so exciting to see. Because, of course, I knew. Like, I knew about the battle that takes place on the beach. But just the timing of it mm-hmm. and just that reveal to Hornigold, I hadn't recalled and it right. was just so thrilling all right. over again right and it's exactly what i mean eleanor lays this out in the end this is exactly what they planned they needed hornigold yes. to go back and tell the governor that mm-hmm. this is what's waiting on this island 
Yeah. Yep. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Okay, so our next moment is when they arrive to the island and they are greeted by the queen. Mm -hmm. And then the queen sees their person who got beat up by Dobbs. Yes, and asks about it. Uh huh. And Maddie says it was a misunderstanding, mm-hmm. which is the answer. raises an eyebrow for Flint. Yeah. Is, that is not the story that he was told. That was uh-huh. not the story he was told. And now we get a new moment of seeing where Flint and Silver stand with each other. Mm-hmm. And now Silver is the one being nonchalant. Yeah, it's true. Isn't I'm he? Just saying like, I took care of it. Right. I got it in hand. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, yes. And I, I love how even he says it. And I, I don't think this was planned out. I think that he is just like he I think he surprised himself. Like Flint's like, you didn't mention that. And he's like, he said, I didn't mention it to you because I don't know. I just didn't. I just didn't. Yeah. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I had it in hand. He, right. yeah, he had it taken care right. of. Right. And there was no reason to bring Flint in on it. Right. And again, he says it's sorted. And then Flint's like sorted right. how and he tells him and then and then Silver's just kind of like, yeah. Sorted. Sorted. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I just found that really interesting. I mean, maybe there could be a different reading. Maybe someone could read that as Silver, as this being Silver playing something. But I I honestly feel like Silver kind of surprised himself in this moment. I think so, yeah. When I think he's surprised to find that Flint has commentary on it, because I think he was so sure that Flint would just kind of give him that, you know, uh, a nod of affirmation. Right. You know, you did good, kid. Right. And instead, <laughs> he got that about the the double anchor thing. But yeah, he did. He did. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's true. He didn't. And then we have the porch conversation. Mm-hmm. I love this porch conversation. It's really amazing. This is I mean, they have so many great conversations together. Um, and of course, we're coming up on the best one of the series. But this one yes. right here is quite lovely. Also, yes, this is very lovely. And I think it's very very significant about a lot of stuff okay so let's yeah. uh, let's go through the oh parts i also want to share a quick oh, note sure. too absolutely here that, uh, silver has never been hotter is what i wrote down <laughs> <laughs> he is really nailing the pirate look all of a sudden he's got this super great coat he's just yeah i i, I like this better than pretty boy smarmy silver that we got in season one well now that you've said that should I uh-huh. should I make our little announcement real quick? Should I pause to make our you announcement? You should. Speaking of hot silver. So, okay. Sorry. I'm going to pause our usual thing to announce that uh, Luke Arnold, now, now that you've called him hot, because, you know, we can't interview anyone unless you've called them hot. <laughs> <laughs> I make no apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Luke Arnold's going to be on Fathoms Deep with us. So we yeah, will, he is. We'll, we'll give you details uh, soon about when mm-hmm. that episode will be airing. But yes, he yeah. he has agreed to come join us and have a drink with us and talk oh, about I'm Black so Sails. Excited. We are going to pick his brain about this incredible character work and all the fun that we know he had on set and making this production. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're very excited. So, Luke, mm-hmm. if you're listening, hi. <laughs> we'll be talking. Hi. We'll be talk- Daphne likes to strip on camera. You're going to love it. <laughs> Blushing so deeply. <laughs> back to back to our actual conversation. Right, uh, right. So yes, yes. Silver is quite hot now in his uh, cape, <laughs> in his new clothes and his cape capability, um, capability and coat. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. He's got a coat. Two things we like best in our captains. <laughs> oh, is that why we've always loved Flint? <laughs> oh yeah, coats and capability. <laughs> Hashtag coats and capability. (laughs) Okay, okay. All right. Well, they're sitting on a porch. (laughs) They are. Yes. Yes. And Flint wants to talk about the whole Dobbs situation. And boy, does Dobbs look broody. He's just like hanging out, just being angry over there. And, you know, Flint says, this is this is a really important moment for us right now. This big war we're about to start. And Absolutely. We kind of need everyone behind us, and you maybe just mm-hmm. created a problem. Which is an interesting way to look at it that I don't think that Silver had considered. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, I think Silver at the moment was very focused. I mean, like he said, he's like, if I didn't do this, you likely would have been stranded on NASA, and part of our crew it's would be so dead, true. and the other part would be in that cage. Like, you did not... 
Well, he knew that he had to do it, and it was the right. only thing to be done in the moment. Exactly. I just don't think he realized that it was a Band-Aid over a bullet hole. Right. Like, I think he thought he had solved a problem rather than just putting off a problem until later. But again, even Flint admits he doesn't know. Like, because Silver's like, do you think I went too far? And Flint's like, I have no idea. Maybe you went too far. Maybe you didn't go far enough. Maybe you did the exact right thing. But that's not the point yep. that Flint wants to make. It's not the point. Right. Yep. So uh, he says... Yeah, he makes some face. And then I love it. So he's like, Do you, if you have anything to add, you should just fucking say it. Uh-huh. Which is Again, great. I love this silver. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. He is kind of hot. And like, I love new silver, that New silver is pretty awesome. Kinda, new silver is pretty hot. Yeah. Um, and I love that Flint just kind of smirks and answers him right yep. away. Yes. And, yeah. you know, this, I think, is like full on. That's not why you did it. That's what right. he says. Yeah, because the half smile. Oh, that's not why you right. did it. Right. So yeah. this is, yeah, this is Flint, like, doing his thing. This is a planned yes. out conversation. He has he he has a purpose, and let, I want to discuss at the end what we think it might be. Ah. I think this is my this is my thinking. Okay. okay, so he tells Silver he lays out a storyline like that. You know, he told Dobbs something, and then Dobbs right looked something less than contrite, yeah. and then he says, "You felt the darkness," mm-hmm. and they had just talked about the darkness not so long ago. That's true. Yeah. Well, and remember, um, Silver, too, had just talked about it to Maddie. Right. Yes, which I think is going to be important. Right. Uh-huh. And he said, I, I really like this. He said that you felt hate for him showing indifference to the authority you sacrificed so much to acquire. Right. And this is exactly mm-hmm. what we've talked about in Silver's arc in this season is what he has sacrificed to be. Yes. I mean, again, we frame it in terms of Silver's sacrifice to be part of a community. Right. Mm -hmm. Flint sees it as a sacrifice he made to gain authority over people. To gain authority. So now we're seeing how Flint maybe sees Silver or how Flint sees his pl- his own place in community. I mean, there's just so many. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting to me to try to parse out how much of this is Flint being insightful about Silver. How much is this uh-huh. Flint actually talking about projecting. himself, right? Which yes, Silver brings he's up. Absolutely projecting. Yeah, I think that's uh-huh. most of it. And how much of it's strategic. So let's talk about the strategic part at the end. Oh, okay. Sure. And it's interesting. So, like, he says hate and then he says pride. For questioning what kind of man you are. And then the part, yeah, the part that's most interesting to me here is you heard a voice that sounded like reason. Mm-hmm. And there was reason in it. Like the most compelling lies that are comprised almost entirely of truth. Mm-hmm. And that's what it does. Like he's describing the darkness. Now yes. we're really, I feel mm-hmm. like we're really getting a window here to how Flint sees what's been going on inside of him all this time yeah okay Uh uh-huh well and remember it it reminds me also of that conversation with the admiral Mm -hmm. about the two voices in your head and which one's right exactly Mm -hmm. this is not the first time we're going to talk about voices in this episode right Mm -hmm. well and it's another theme that comes up a lot of times uh this idea that any strong emotion is going to cloud your judgment and present itself <gasps> as the one true That's thing that true. you must follow. I mean, that in this whole show, because we have that with people who are in love. We yes. have that with ambition. We have this like... <gasps> yep, we have it with fear. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that could work for almost all of our characters, actually. I think so. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's fascinating. Hmm. Right. And then Flint says next, and this also relates to all emotions, actually, not just darkness, that if you deny it, the more powerful it gets and the more likely it is to consume you. And what does he say that you have to learn to master it? He says you must learn to know its presence well, so you may Mm -hmm. use it rather than it use you. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. And he says it cloaks itself in whatever it must to compel you to action. (gasps) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Right. And then that's when Silver asks if you if this is something you've experienced and Flint very again, very I feel like in this in this moment a very um deliberate casualness. He says yes. that he says, Yep. Like very mm-hmm. not Flint like way of speaking. 
And that's when Silver says one of my favorite lines. He says, I can't tell if this is a warning or a welcome. It is a great line and it is perfectly delivered. Yes. I love Luke Arnold's delivery of that and line. It's, yeah, it's the perfect line for, you know, kind of where they are in their relationship. Yeah. I mean, they've just, we just saw them with the whole ship thing, have this beautiful moment of working together. But there is mm-hmm. always this tension between these two because they're such strong personalities. Yes. And they know yeah, too but much. I think that you're right. I think that Flint sees so much of himself in Silver. And Silver sees much less. Right. I mean, he understands that call to the darkness, but Silver is not as like Flint as Flint thinks that he is. Do you think it's as Flint thinks he is or as Flint wants him to be? Either way, it doesn't matter. The point is that Flint does not see Silver clearly. Right. No, no, definitely not. But I think there is a difference between just seeing someone as like you and wanting them to be like you. And this is this goes back like to, you know, with Vane and Eleanor when Vane claimed that they are the oh, same. Right. Uh-huh. I, th- I yes. think there is something there's something there's a level of vulnerability in wanting someone to be like you that's higher. Right. Than just oh, thinking they're course. like you. You know what I mean? Like judging yeah, them to be yeah, like because you. Because you need to feel understood. Y- yeah. Or d- yeah. Okay. I-, I do think I do think there's a significant difference there. And I. Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think we have to hold on to that thought. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Conceded. <laughs> so yeah. So right when he says, I can't tell if this is a warning or a welcome. Flint has a very significant look on his face, but then we hear the horn mm-hmm. because Scott died. Then we hear the horn that announces that the king is dead, yep. which was really haunting and lovely. Yep. And then... Uh, wait, let's not And then. Actually, I would like to move back oh, for a second. Okay, I'm sorry. Fine, it, all right. No, it's okay. I know, you, I know what you want to talk about, but I'm going to make you talk. Yes. <laughs> I know. It's fine. We just have to remember what it comes hot on the heels Yeah, of, don't you worry. All. Okay. Don't you worry. We'll, we'll get there. I like chronology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm messing with chronology here for the sake it's of okay. no beans, worries. I guess. I can keep up, girl. Don't you worry. <laughs> I know you can. You've, you've been doing it for many episodes <laughs> of, me, of me saying, no, no, not yet. <laughs> Hold your tongue. <sighs> <sighs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> no, first, let's talk for a minute about Maddie and Scott. And I must bring mm. into this something that our friend and listener jen has been waiting for us to talk about but first let's just talk about the actual scene okay okay so when maddie visits scott uh, there's there's not a lot in this episode but it's very heartbroken because she had a realization she said that she went to nassau she told him about eleanor yes Uh and then she says that this war will have a lot of meaning but to you it will be a civil war yes and that you have people on both sides of it. You have daughters on both sides of it. And he says, only you. And he says, only you. And I think she was going to try to make him some sort of promise when he, he interrupted her. Because she said, I want you to know. And that's when he called her closer. Oh, that's right. So I don't know. Some sort of promise. You that's think. what I feel like. That he, she felt like she needed to maybe tell him she was going to protect Eleanor. That was my interpretation of it. That she was going to try to... How could she possibly protect I don't know. That she would try... I don't know. I mean, I think she was very moved by the idea. I mean, when we had that scene in NASA where she, you know, not remembered, but thought about the fact that she and Eleanor were playmates and that there's no way that she's not, again, calling back to this thing about girls and their fathers. Like, there's no way that Mm -hmm. she just wasn't... She isn't constantly completely aware of the fact that you know, that Eleanor was the one who had him present. And he says only you and that Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, this whole scene kills me every time I watch it. Mm -hmm. So do you think that only you is true for him emotionally or that he said it for her on his deathbed? I don't know. It doesn't. Okay. Let me quickly bring up the thing that the Jen has been waiting for two seasons for us (laughs) to talk about. Fair enough. So Jen asked me to bring this up ages ago, which is the scene in season one episode. I don't remember which episode it is, even though I just rewatched that bit just to like make sure. But it's when they are on the Andromache and Scott is in the slavehold. Yeah. And Uh and they're trying to convince him to help them get the pirates attention so that they can escape. And he doesn't want to. And he says, there are weapons on this ship that could harm someone I love. 
Okay. So Scott's story way back then was that he tried uh-huh. to thwart Eleanor's plan of getting the guns for Flint right. to protect her. Okay. So so uh-huh. Jen's question is who was he actually trying to protect Eleanor or was he trying is there some way we can discuss this where he was trying to protect Maddie? Maddie in the island. Yeah. Um so I came up with something. I was gonna say, yeah, I don't think I could pull back that okay. far, unfortunately. So you go ahead, let's hear your thoughts. Okay. So Okay, so if, I mean, again, I I don't have an answer. There's basically different options Uh here. So the option is that he was talking about Eleanor, and the only you is either a reframing of Scott's feelings, or that, like you said, or he's saying this to Maddie to make her feel better. Okay, Uh so that's one option. The other option is that he is worried for NASA, and we know that the two communities were complete, like that basically the island and his biological family is completely dependent mm-hmm. on NASA. So that basically anything yeah. that threatens NASA also threatens his wife and his daughter. Okay. So sorry, Jen, sure. I don't have a, I don't have a, like a definitive answer for you. Yeah. But it's an interesting thought. Yeah. I don't know if we'll ever know. It's a beautiful scene either way. <laughs> it's a very, way, it's a yeah. very moving scene either way. The thing I love most about this scene is not actually the only you. It's the fact that, that Maddie, that it's just a moment of us seeing what a thoughtful, caring, intuitive person Maddie is. Yes. Yeah, it certainly is that. Wants to bring him some comfort. She wants to bring him some comfort. That she's not, that yes. she took this personal sadness about right. about herself and Eleanor and her father and actually yeah, turn sure. that into something she would be concerned about him. Oh, she's so wonderful and compassionate. She's so wonderful and compassionate. Yeah. Mm, I like that a lot. Yeah. So that's the part that's most important to me. I don't have a mm-hmm. real answer for what happened in that scene in season one. Right. Again, but the emotional impact here is the same. It would be interesting yes. to know. I mean, I I would kind of love the idea because the truth is, I mean, Eleanor wasn't a good daughter to Scott. Like if I feel like he was, that's very, I feel like he was a father figure to her in a lot of ways. Yeah. That was, it was unappreciated. Well, it's like, she's, yeah, he's like missing and she doesn't know where he is. And she's not like wondering about, she just like, doesn't seem to be talking about like, where's Scott? What happened to Scott? I'm so worried about Scott. It's true. I feel totally okay with the idea. I mean, I guess sad for Eleanor because you know, (laughs) Eleanor, Eleanor, you know, just a lot of people have pretended to have feelings for Eleanor that they don't, I guess. And some people really did. And she mm-hmm. wasn't really good at recognizing mm-hmm. that until recently. Mm-hmm. But um, but I do. I like it for Scott, I guess, the idea that that actually his loyalty was always with his wife and his daughter and not with Eleanor. Yes. I like it. too. OK, now we can talk about Maddie and Silver. Okay. Well, I mostly wanted to talk about this because we had talked earlier about that conversation he had with Maddie Mm -hmm. about people, once you find yourself drawn into the darkness like Mm -hmm. that, that you need someone to be a tether that will will keep you, you know, truer to yourself and attached to the good. So he comes away from this conversation with Flint, where Flint is really trying to pull him into the darkness with him is trying to say, I know that it feels good to you. And even though he's saying it, again, you know, just just what Silver said, I can't tell if this is a warning or a welcome. Right. Like, are you actually trying, trying to warn me off of this? Or are you trying to get me to be the kind of person that you are and to embrace the exactly. darkness? Well, to embrace it and, and use it, but yeah. Embrace it and right. use it, sure. Um, but then he gets this moment where he has to exercise compassion and is tethered again to mm-hmm. Maddie. And it's beautiful. It is beautiful. It is so beautiful. Just that lovely embrace. And she's showing, I mean, she's been so strong right. this entire time with him. I'm really teaching him and leading mm-hmm. him in many ways. Absolutely. And for her to show this kind of vulnerability mm-hmm. to him was really beautiful. Right. Well, and the, she, you know, I, I love that when he first walked in, she was being stoic. You know, she was, it's true. she was still being the strong person. And I, well, I love on both sides. I mean, I love that he admits that he doesn't know what to say to her. And that's the moment where she just that's loses true. it and runs over to him. Like that he, 
I wonder if that's why, because he showed the vulnerability. Exactly. First. I, I that's what I feel like. I feel mm. like that was such a that was such an honest thing for him to yes. say right then that he so clearly. I mean, he went up those stairs. He so clearly wanted to find her as a tether and or be a support to her, and you know, but he didn't know what to do I with think himself. At the time that he went in, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I don't think he was he was thinking about how she could help him right, as a tether. Right. I think that he just went into. Yeah, check on I her. think so yeah. too, and. It, I, yeah, I just feel like, yeah, and he hesitates before he puts his arms around her. Like, this is just not, mm, just this bit. is not yeah. a universe that he, I mean, we don't know his backstory. Again, my dear hope is that we, that we get some of it. Something. It would be really wonderful. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, it's always been so beautiful and enriching every time we learn a character's backstory. That is true. Right? It sure has been. Every yeah. single time it has been an amazing experience for us. So I just really, really, really hope we get this from Silver. Yeah. But yeah, just he this is not a familiar world for him, a familiar set of emotions for him, a familiar. Right. I mean, think about what a loner he was to begin with. Right? Mm-hmm. right. And then he found community, but it was community of, you know, of pirate brethren, which is a different yes. si- side of community. But this sort of like very personal. Love. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, he has a very intense relationship with Flint. Yes. But this is a soft relation. This is, you know, the idea yeah. of someone just collapsing. I mean, Flint Flint collapses in a room by himself. Yeah. But Maddie uh-huh. collapses. Right. Doors. But Maddie collapses in Silver's arms. Mm. And and again, this is what we've watched. We've watched Silver, who thought that he was best off by himself. We've watched him by inches and then by miles learn that the thing he's most needs in the world, the thing that attracts him the most is connection with other people. Yeah, I think you're right. And so this is now a new level of connection. I wonder if he understands that enough about himself and that's, that's why he fears his relationship with Flint. That's possible. That's possible. I mean, again, it's kind of like what you said about about strong emotions and that being like the darkness, like yes. the thing that you're most attracted to is the thing that is most dangerous for you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to be the case, doesn't it? Hmm. It can be. <laughs> How funny. Again, it's a tiny scene with so much going on in it and so much so beauty. Much happens. Mm-hmm. Ah, I love it very much. All righty. Well, Liz, are you ready to move to Nassau? I am. Yeah, I'm always ready to go to Nassau. <laughs> it's a little, little harder. It's in my Twitter handle. <laughs> <laughs> Slight, slightly more, more difficult place to go this week than other weeks. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, let's go straight into it. Let's talk about Eleanor and Vane in that in that cell. Oh gosh. First of all, the beauty, the striking beauty and the visuals of this scene are incredible. Yes. Charles Vane in that square of light with the light streaming in from the window is just marvelous. And her in that green dress, like some avenging angel mm-hmm. with her Botticelli curls, just amazing. I thought about the green dress. I thought it was very interesting. I know he's wearing gray, so basically we're we're in a very, you know, we're, we're in one color palette, basically. Yes. But mm-hmm. I felt like the color of her dress, like, fit so well with the walls. Like, when you first see her standing in the doorway, mm-hmm. there was it was almost like she was part of the cell in a way. Like a part of her, a part of his imprisonment. Yeah, that's very Ooh. interesting. Yep, that there you go. <laughs> yeah, part of his imprisonment <laughs> potentially has could be called that from the very beginning. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, now is probably a good time to bring up uh, Janine's theory, real quick. Oh yes. Uh-huh. So our friend Janine, a long time ago, sent us a beautiful essay about Baroque art and and black sales. Uh-huh. Um, and one of the things I really loved, and I've been waiting, holding on to this until this episode, was that she sent us a painting by Caravaggio, which is The Calling of St. Matthew. Okay, everyone, if you're in front of the internet, call up that picture real quick. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm going to do my best to talk about it properly. In this painting, you have that same thing. And she said this, this is a common, this is a common thing in Baroque art, but you have the same, the same image of a very strong beam of light coming from the side, the same way you see with Vane here uh, in many aspects of this, of this episode. Oh, Matthew was the um, tax collector. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is the moment when Jesus called to him and he was in, he was in the process of collecting taxes he sure and was. you uh -huh. see this beam of light kind of yeah. beaming down on him. And that's supposed to be the moment where he just basically up and joined Jesus. Just left yep. everything. And yeah. Yep. So interesting. Okay. So I like this parallel to vain mm -hmm. in that, that Matthew as a tax collector was kind of kind of the last person you would expect to become a saint and an, and a follower Definitely. of Jesus, yeah. right? Right, absolutely. Right. And Vane also kind of the last person you would expect as a, like a brutal pirate to become uh -huh. saint like. Oh, right. Okay, cuz he's about right. to and be a martyr. He's about to be a martyr, which which Matthew uh -huh. also was. Yes, he was. Interesting. Yes. Well, and the thing, too, about Matthew, well, about tax collectors in general at the time, is that they always took more than they were supposed mm -hmm. to and skimmed off the top. Oh, really? So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tax collectors were like the scum mm -hmm. of the earth because of that, because everybody knew that they were taking more, right. but well, the Romans just let them. Well, but and also so. they were part of the system that was... They were part of the that system, was, part of civilization. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, but Charles Vane was certainly, I mean, Charles Vane certainly looked out for nobody but Charles Vane. No, I don't think it's, it's not a, it's, I think the only part of a parallel here, and, and Janine's not mm -hmm. saying that it's specifically Matthew, but that this was an example of how in art of that period, yes, the okay. beam of light sure. represented, you know, kind of, you know, a, like a calling. a calling exactly right sure which is okay that's great then. right so that's really perfect and uh, yeah, yeah the beautiful. only parallel i made between matthew specifically and vane specifically is that they were unlikely candidates yes <laughs> uh -huh. which they certainly are unlikely candidates that then that then through their choices ended up being martyrs mm -hmm. i want to I'm going to tie this to another thing. This is where this is where I get really, really nerdy, and and hopefully will make sense in the complexity of what I'm trying to say about all of this before we actually, I guess, get too okay. much into the conversation. I'm going to bring this back to last week. Okay. Last week we talked about whatever it is, clavichord, harpsichord. We talked about yes, playing the single note. Mm -hmm. And I said I really wish I could make a connection between right between Vane and Abigail. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to listen to our podcast about oh, the season finale of season two. And how meta. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I can read my notes because I have them all. But if I read my notes, then I don't get your side of the story. So I listened to our oh, podcast. Uh -huh. I wanted to Fair hear enough. what both of us sure. had to say. We talked about back then we were talking about Abigail as a teller of truth. The, oh. We completely tied Abigail to the concept of yes. truth. We did. Because right when okay. she was doing the single note, single note, single note, she then had a conversation with her father, Peter Ash, about the yes. virtue of truth. Mm -hmm. And that back then was tying her to Miranda, who had just died, not just yes. in her sadness, but that Miranda mm -hmm. died in the process of finding and speaking the truth. Yeah. There are more parallels. So I'm now going to as we talk about this this scene, there are mm -hmm. there are more parallels to to the season finale of season 2 than I realized that I only remembered oh. once once I looked at how we talked about about that episode. Wow. Okay. So Let's continue. But yes, I think right. I think that I mean, Bane doing the single note over and over again, obviously in Miranda's house is a tie to Miranda, but that's also about truth. Ultimately, mm -hmm. this is my belief. OK, which, again, also 
the idea of being an apostle and martyred for for ideas and faith and and your words. Mm, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. This is super geeky me, everyone. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. Okay. Bring it on. The first thing that Eleanor says to Vane is she reads this, you know, plea that, you know, obviously yes. she wrote for him. And then she says that if he signs this, they will take care of him privately and mercifully. Mm-hmm. That it will be short and dignified. Right. Yes. So I'm going to now remind you what Peter Ash said to Flint when Flint okay. was chained during his, when he was the one in chains yes. and he was a condemned man. Mm-hmm. Ash offered Flint that, that if he did what he wanted, if he basically confessed, that his sentence would be fulfilled privately and quietly. Mm-hmm. And he also okay. offered that Miranda would go to rest peacefully with her name cleared. And that's wow. when Flint said, that's not what Miranda wanted. She uh, wanted the truth to be known. The truth to be known. Wow. Okay. So that's parallel number one. Okay. Okay. Now we can get into like vain, vain badassery for a bit. <laughs> I love, I love that when she. Vane is a complete uh, badass in this episode. That's for sure. This, this is best vain. This is best vain because he yeah. is so badass and so sad. I mean, it's just, my heart is breaking yes. for him through all of this. And I don't know how Zach McGowan did this. Like, cause he barely moves his face. And yet mm-hmm. you see every bit of both of those things going on all the time. Yes. He's yes. it's funny. It's funny that we talked so much about Vane being um that we talked a few episodes ago about Vane being twitchy, that Vane is always in motion and, and he Oh right, yeah. He does not move during this. He barely oh. moves. Mm-hmm. That's true. And yet, just express. I don't even know. I like. I watch it over and over again, and I'm just like, "How is he doing this? How is he? How am I just feeling modeling. all these feelings?" Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but yes, I love when he says, "What a fantasy this must have been for you." Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just really, I just loved that line. <laughs> really put her in her place. Right from the beginning, yeah. He comes out swinging. But this, I mean, this whole conversation was really hard to watch just because the two of them do know each other and understand each other so well that they know just where to hurt the other person. They know exactly what to say to cause the most harm. And I, it's painful to watch that. Right. I mean, they do. He says, you know, the thing about the one crime she actually cares about. Right. That nobody else even, no one else cared about even enough to call it a crime. Right. That didn't matter to anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. And then she. It really was a slap in the right. face. Right. And then he, she slaps him back by saying, I, Charles, she quotes him back, basically. She says, yep. I, Charles Vane, I look a man in the face when I take something from him. Mm-hmm. So I want to start with this part where he says, where she says that you weren't man enough to face me. You acted this out on an innocent man with whom you had no quarrel. So we've been talking about about Eleanor like last episode when she was saying yeah. to Rogers about how all she cared about was getting revenge for her father. Yeah. Suddenly that line seems less crazy to me because this right. whole scene, she has just told herself a story. Like she really That's what I was going to say. She is rewriting history. She is like so rewriting history and yes. not to manipulate or do I mean she's like she no, really just believes for this insanity. Right. And she has believed it. Yeah, just to balm her soul. Yeah. yeah. I mean that is crazy. Like we know that Vane had an mm. actual quarrel with Richard Guthrie. Yeah. Of <laughs> Richard course. Richard Guthrie was anything but an innocent man. Right. He was totally part of this conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah, and the last thing I wanted to bring up about this about the Richard Guthrie part is I started to think about that. Like, okay, so what if taking Richard Guthrie, what if taking Richard Guthrie and then needing to kill Richard Guthrie was a way for uh-huh. Vane to actually protect Eleanor? Like, remember the state that Vane was in back then? Like, Eleanor had just stolen Abigail from them. Like, they're Yes. Okay. They're basically pot of gold. 
Vane was already in a situation where his, you know, his crew was like not 100% happy with him because they didn't understand why mm-hmm. he was doing stuff he was doing. Right. So he needed to show them that he was going to get some sort of revenge for this thing that Eleanor did. Okay. Yeah. So it's very possible that when they took Richard Guthrie, like, he might not have even had a choice whether he killed Richard Guthrie or not. Like he had to do something to appease his crew. Mm-hmm. That is true. So it's just, yeah, I don't know. That sure. was just a thought I had that this, you know, mm-hmm. not that it matters. I mean, she's going to be just as pissed either way. It doesn't really, matter. ultimately yeah, it doesn't really matter. As far as she's concerned, there's no reason. Right. I do love that. He just calls out. He was a shit. I know. <laughs> I really did I love know. that. Yeah. Who cared only for himself and for you not Right. Well, and this again, I want to bring this back to truth. Like, look at what the two of them are doing. She's telling this like totally rewritten version of history, which granted isn't exactly lying, but it's not not lying. Like she is tied to not truth and he is tied to truth here. Okay. He's telling her the hard truth. All right. Yeah. So so she's talking about self-deception. Right. Yes, and he is telling hard truths. But again, I don't think what what do you think his motivation for telling her this is right now? Yeah, I think I actually wrote that down. Why is he doing this? Oh, yeah, I did. I wrote that down. What's what's yeah. the point of this? <laughs> why are you doing this? Well, that's why I love when she says you can't comprehend what you yeah, took from me right. or why it was good. Right. And I think that's what she was talking about, not the fact that he not that he took her father physically Mm -hmm. but that he took her father that memory that she had preserved the potential of what could be yeah no no that's definitely true and why why did he do that? why did he take it or why did he talk about it no why did he tell her now i mean i think he saw it as honor right because he sees truth as yes he does maybe he's so caught up in the virtue yes in the virtue itself that he's forgot he's forgotten to look at what what that will mean to Eleanor and to her emotions. I, I think sometimes we can look at a virtue and think that um, that it is the ultimate good, even when that virtue can cause harm. Absolutely. I mean, if there's anything that's common amongst our characters here, I think that's, I mean, look at everything Flint does. <laughs> think, <laughs> yeah, well, he doesn't do everything for virtue. No, he doesn't. But I think, you know, again, well, okay, we don't have to go down that road because he's definitely someone who tells himself stories. Um, yes, he certainly is. Talk about yourself. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think I think Vane felt compelled. I mean, he is he's, you know, what did he say? Uh, the line that I love is the life cycle of your affections. Yes, I was just looking at that. Right. Too. Uh-huh. I think he's just he I, I think he's just compelled to say it. I mean, he's just he's so he well, he's so hurt the, and angry. The, rest of the quote, a man you love yes. who speaks the truth. Right. Shunt it aside for the one who will tell you everything you wanted to hear. Yep. I think he's just, he just, I don't think he can help himself but say this stuff right now. Because he's just so horrified with her. I don't think he's like trying to convince her. No. No. I think that's, that's long gone, that potential. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he just, he just, it's for his honor. I mean, he just, he's just like, you are so wrong. And she is so yeah, wrong. Yeah, just wanting to be yeah, right. I see what you're saying. I don't know if it's mm-hmm. wanting to be right. It's just wanting to like not just allow her to just go on and on with this like crazy fabrication yeah. she's come up with. Oh, so even that for her good? Oh, no. Is it more to that paternal? No, I don't think so. No? I don't think it's for her good. Okay. Honestly, I think he's just, he's just, I think he's just. Just wants the truth yeah, out. Yeah, he just wants, wants the truth yeah, out just there. Yeah, isn't interested yeah. in your self-deception. Yeah. Okay. I really think sure. that's what it is more than anything. So the last thing I wanted to say about this, like aside from truth and falsehood, is the interesting situation that the two of them have not seen each other for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So like he talks about how she is willing to set aside someone she loves for the sake of ambition right at the moment when Eleanor is actually perhaps probably actually in love. Oh, right. right. So Uh like they don't. Yes. Like, you're right that they know each other so well in a way, in, in the ability to hurt each other. Right. Yeah. But they don't actually know. And then her speech at the end where she says that you cannot comprehend because there's no goodness in you, no humanity, yes. no compromise, no progress or forgiveness. And it's like, you know what? We've we've just... Which she's totally she's wrong, totally wrong. That. Like, yeah. you and I have spent hours yeah. talking about how Vane has developed all of those yes. things. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I thought the one that really hit home, though, was when she said, you're not a man. You're deformed, yes. unformed, Ugh. missing all that takes shape under the care of a mother's love. That was harsh. That was harsh and also kind of fascinating because she also grew up most of her life without because a she mother. Also, I know. Yes. That was fascinating because of right. that. I mean, I was trying to remember. I was trying to like figure out the timeline, like exactly when she lost her mother, and I don't know. I feel like she was pretty young, though, if I remember correctly. Pretty young, I think, like seven yeah, or eight. Yeah, exactly. It so me. it's just yeah. that's also a fascinating thing that she chose those words. Yes, it was interesting. Mm. You know, because you know that was a beautiful scene. I watched it twice. Yeah, yeah, because I stopped and took so many notes <laughs> that I had to watch it once through just for of continuity. Course, cause, cause there's, uh-huh. Yeah, there's just so much here. Yes. So yeah, so that was my last note here is that neither of them are exactly the person that the other one is describing. Right. Again, that's about both of them ha- having a lot of growth. Like both of these characters mm-hmm. have had a huge amount of growth in absence of the other one. So that's just about misunderstanding. Yes. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, and having these old scripts for that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But that's different than the sure. question of truth and not truth. Yes. It Again, is. what Eleanor is doing right here, I don't think is exactly a parallel with Peter Ash because Peter Ash was deliberately lying. Right. Okay. Or sure. deliberately mm-hmm. going along with lies. Like the lawyers wanted to lie. There yeah. were a lot of, you know, but so she's, she's retelling her own story in her mind to the point where she clearly believes it, which is a little different, but it's still, I still think that there is an interesting parallel here. I mean, a Bain's always been about truth. Like I, I found myself mm-hmm. like sure. here when I'm, when I when he's telling the story about Richard Guthrie, about how Richard Guthrie begged for his life and then offered his money yes. and then offered Eleanor in exchange. And for a split second, I was like, do, you, do I think he did that? And I was like, yeah, he totally did that. One, yeah. mm-hmm. we know J- Richard Guthrie. And two, right. we know Vane. He's just not a liar. That is true. He just yeah. isn't. I mean, if there's really, he just if there's yep. anyone who embodies truth in Black Sails, it has always been Vane. Wow, that's a good call. Mm -hmm. So I just really feel like this is all just completely tied together. And the other character, ironically, the other character who was so much a truth speaker was Abigail. Yes. So this says a lot about Vane right now, right before we lose him. Uh, (laughs) He has never been more compelling. Right, I know. Yeah. Okay. Pretty tragic. All right. So uh, should we move on to Eleanor interacting with other characters? Okay, sure. We'll get back to Vane, obviously. Um, Yeah. (laughs) One last time. Uh, You did not just say one last time. Uh, I did say one last time. You're like double breaking my heart with the Hamilton reference today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bad friend. You're a bad friend. (laughs) <laughs> no, you're an awesome friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone who believes that someone breaking my heart is a bad friend doesn't know me. <laughs> doesn't know you very well. That's the sure that's the surefire way to keep you. <laughs> Again, just in fiction, not in reality. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have our Eleanor and Roger scene when she comes back to him and he is bedridden now. Yes. Mm -hmm. This was all very interesting. It was. It's funny. You have so sold me on them. It's so funny. Like, what did I notice? (laughs) What did I notice? We have a room where they're talking military strategy, which is my Mm -hmm. thing. I love that thing. Right? Yeah. What do I notice? When Eleanor walks in the room, Rogers is not listening to anyone else anymore. Yeah. He just, he sees her. That's it. Mm -hmm. He refocuses. He's just like kind of going, okay, 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 okay. And then he kicks them all out. I blame you. (laughs) Okay. I accept it, I suppose. (laughs) This is all I see now is I see the deep love. Yeah. Wood Rogers and Eleanor. Yep. Uh Uh, Yes. I love that. I actually really love that. It was pretty amazing. It was really nice. Well, and it was interesting that he gave her so much authority there in that moment too says so everything comes through her oh yeah and i think the reason that he did that is because did you notice that as soon as everybody left the room and the door shut mm-hmm. you know what the first thing he did was the very first thing he did was that he coughed wow yes he showed how sick he was 
he had to hold that back. Right. He was in the room. Right, right. He had to look like he was still completely competent in his, you know, uh, at his best or as best as he could be. Wow. So you're doing it even more. Now I'm just like even more sold. Oh, yeah. But as soon as it's just her in the room, he can show his weakness. He can show the vulnerability again. And therefore, he can really make those decisions. And he can, can also have her support right. and her wisdom in, in making those hard calls. Yeah, absolutely. And he's not having to save face with all of these right. men. Right, right, right. No, that's totally true. Again, in partnership, some of the weight is taken off. Yeah. In a good partnership, right. anyway. Right, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's funny, like now suddenly Eleanor is very truthful. Like he says, he says, uh, as long as you've left it behind you about Vane. And she says, mm -hmm. there's no leaving it oh, behind, but I'm ready to move forward. Yeah. I love that. There is no leaving it behind, but I am ready to move forward. That speaks a lot to me right now in my life. Yeah. And I love it. That was, that one really resonated with right. me. Right. And it there's no leaving it behind, no, but I'm ready to of move course. forward. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say, I feel like, I mean, we haven't gone through all of Eleanor's scenes. Like, this is the the one moment when Eleanor's really telling the truth in this whole episode. Yes. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. That's a great, that's a great note. Yeah, she sure is. That kind of honesty, it's, it's uncommon for Eleanor. It is. I don't know if we've ever seen her have right. that before. I don't think that we right. have. Uh the closest was probably with Flint. The close, well, the closest was was Wood Rogers last episode. But yes, the the closest character. Well, no, I mean, that's true. Other the closest yeah, character, other character yeah. that she's had any amount of honesty with was Flint. But she was always performing for Flint. Also, that is true. She always yeah. wanted Flint to like respect her and yes. Again, yes. Flint. I love the man, but you know he's not really he's no Woods Rogers on that front. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I believe that with Thomas he was that person, but. The flint, right? The flint that's been through all See, of these. And been, I was just, gonna, yeah. The flint who's been through all the things he has. I don't think he's capable of that sort of true, deep emotional tenderness, vulnerability, and tenderness. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, you know, he's got a lot of scars. He's got a lot of emotional scars. We're gonna cut yes, him some slack. A lot of emotional he's scars. He's been through uh -huh. a lot. <laughs> Dimples McGraw. It's hard to even think about Dimples McGraw anymore. I know, right? <laughs> seems so far behind us. <laughs> it is so far behind us. It is. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next uh, the next scene we have is uh, Max and Mapleton. So Mapleton comes to tell Max that it, that the spy was Adele. This is the most I've ever liked Mapleton, by right, the way. Right? This yep. scene. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. She's, uh, she's pretty interesting here. She's interesting. Uh, yes. I mean, again, I never doubted that she was formidable and that she was, you know, smart, obviously, savvy, all right, of those things. Sure. But yes. But yes, she says stuff that's very interesting. Yeah. So yeah. So Max said, you know, I knew I knew that you were spying on me. Like, why didn't you tell Eleanor this? I knew that you were spying on mm -hmm. me for her. And then I find what Mapleton says fascinating. She says, Eleanor Guthrie used that chair not just to vanquish enemies, but to create new ones. Mm -hmm. That some people can only understand themselves through the eyes of those of who those hate, hate them, them. Mm -hmm. and who thrive on sowing the seeds of their own destruction. Mm. That seems pretty insightful to me. I don't know. That's that's very <laughs> insightful. No, I completely agree. Like I said, it's the most I've ever liked her. So like, you're actually quite wise yep, there, Mabelton. exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing about the uh, skewed perspective of emotions right. that we were talking about right. earlier. The, uh, with hate. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So yeah, so Max brings it down to, you know, the language that they have in common. Max says, well, so you think I'm going to outlast her? Mm -hmm. And Mapleton's like, yeah. <laughs> Something like yeah. that. Yeah. But she says, mm -hmm. you know, Eleanor Guthrie has new clothes. Eleanor Guthrie has new friends. But to my eyes, yep. she's no different. Yep. Which I actually, it kind of pains me a little bit because I think that Eleanor is trying to be different. Right. But people can try all sorts of things. That doesn't mean that they're going oh, to succeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cynical. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> you were kinder about veins, are. <laughs> Again, I don't know what's going to happen with Eleanor. I wish her well. Okay. I wish her well. I'm just okay. saying... It's early yet in the game. Sure. She has not yet mart yeah, martyred herself. Right. So, okay. 
Sure. All I'm saying is that is a thing. Sometimes people don't change even when they're trying and even when it looks like they're trying. Vane Mm -hmm. did change. Vane did change. Right? Yep. Yep. And so it does happen. Right. It's just not guaranteed. No, it's not. Probably should not be taken for granted that it will. Right. (sighs) Okay. (laughs) Uh, Again, this is not predictions. I'm not predicting. It's so funny. Okay. Can I just note now that we're in a situation where you're the one... After like so many episodes where you were hating on Eleanor and I was like, but, 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 yeah, but. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's true. and I'm not hating on her. I'm just trying to be realistic about her. But it's just so funny that suddenly you're the one. But, but Eleanor and I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Yep, that's funny. Oh, how the tables have turned. The sh- sands have shifted. The sands have shifted. In the world of Fathoms Deep, <laughs> the sands have shifted. <laughs> Oh, I'm so <laughs> amused. I am quite amused by that. Uh, <laughs> um, but yes, I I really I like this conversation because they're both they're both savvy women. Obviously, like Mapleton, uh-huh. I'm, she would turn on Max in a second. I mean, she is really yeah. this is very silver like like early silver language. Like like yes, I'm supporting you because you seem like the safer bet for me right now. And she but she's like straight up about it. So I like yeah. that. Like Max knows what she's seeing. Mapleton agrees. Yes, that's exactly what you're seeing. But at the same time, it comes with some sort of insight that isn't just about like power. It's a it's a deeper insight. It's an insight about about who Eleanor is, mm-hmm. and how even when okay. when she when she looks like she might be the powerful one, Mapleton's like, I know her. She's she's always going to do this to herself. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. So it's very it's a very interesting combination of strategy and and intuition about people and understanding of people. Yes. Um so yeah, I really thought that was fascinating and I think I feel like okay, so this is where this is where we need to discuss Max. So like now we're going to go down the Max train for a little while, if you don't mind. Okay. So I'm always all aboard. <laughs> I think we both are. Um, right. <laughs> so, um, so Max has a look on her face at the end of this conversation that I feel is a look on her face that she continues to have. And it deepens, in fact. So the next episode is when they're watching uh, Jacob Garrett. So this is Jacob Garrett. Remember from season mm-hmm. two, when I said the man that Anne took up to the room when she was wearing the dress the man from the what? brothel oh, who said yeah. someday I'll be famous and I'll be a captain. Uh huh. That's this guy. That's Jacob Garrett, the one that Billy found and who is like doing speeches about. Oh my I- God, the purveyor of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy about that. I'm so happy to make you happy. Because I wrote down, I wrote that note. Who is this new purveyor of bullshit? <laughs> He's not new at all. We already knew. He's not new at all. Oh my God, I love this show. Yeah, I know. I know. They pulled him back and we liked him. We remember? loved him. And I like him now. I know. Oh, God. He better be awesome in season four. Right. And see, and we knew already that he wanted to be famous. Like he had already explained yeah. that. I'm going to be a captain. I'm going to be famous. Oh. <laughs> we liked him. <laughs> yes, That's we great. Did. I'm so pleased. Jacob Garrett, our friend Jacob Garrett. Um, purveyor of bullshit. Oh, my God. That's totally, that's totally his name now, huh? <laughs> Um, Uh so, uh, (laughs) so they're watching Jacob Garrett purvey bullshit. Is that how you say it? Would you say purvey bullshit? Uh, yes. Uh huh. And so Max obviously has called Eleanor to come see that this is happening and that more and more people are listening to him suddenly. And, and Max says to Eleanor that the only way to deal with this new thing that everyone is, you know, the large groups of people are calling for, that they're opposed to Vane um, being shipped off to England, which is Billy's plot. Oh, yes. We have not gotten Yeah, we haven't gotten that. Sorry. Sorry. A little out of order here. But yeah, he's doing Billy's okay. bidding. And mm-hmm. so Max says to Eleanor that at this point, the, the only two ways to deal with the situation are through appeasement or through violence. Mm. And Eleanor doesn't like the appeasement idea because no, problems and time, mm-hmm. right? 
And then Max says that Eleanor should be careful that it would be wise that whatever happens to Charles Vane, that no one believes it's because of you. Now, what I want to bring up, and we'll have this again at the gallows, is every time Eleanor starts kind of explaining what's going on and saying that it's the governor doing it, Max Mm -hmm. gets that same look on her face. And I feel like there's two ways you could read this look. I read it as sadness. So like when Mableton Mm -hmm. says this thing about Eleanor, you know, always sowing the seeds of her own destruction, Max looks right. Now it could be concern. She could be concerned for Mm -hmm. herself because she's tied her fate to Eleanor to some extent. To some extent. Right. Okay. Yeah. It could be concern because, I mean, the other thing I thought of was that, you know, from the end of season one, Max has basically tried to become Eleanor. Right. She said that very specifically. Okay, yes. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. In the in the season in the end of season one, she said very specifically. Um, and that's when she says the thing about shifting sands. So mm-hmm. is this Max like being concerned because she's just recently started to learn how difficult it is to be in the shoes formerly occupied or the chair formerly occupied by Eleanor? Right. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, or is it just, you know, so is she concerned for herself? Is she concerned for what she's becoming? Or is she just sad for Eleanor? I don't know which Mm -hmm. one it is. I, you know, I don't know either. I, what, what struck me is when they first started talking and Max said, I am your friend. Yeah. So that's at the gallows. And I wrote down, are you? Right. (laughs) Exactly. Well, this goes to the same question is what is Max's motivation here? What? I, yeah, I don't understand those two at all. And, and I have heard tell from you. (laughs) <laughs> that we're going to get more of them in season four. <laughs> that we got a vague promise from John Steinberg that a there's a gonna... <laughs> promise from John Steinberg. <laughs> yes. Yes. At New York Comic Con. told you nothing. Very, okay. yeah. Very well. vague promise from John Steinberg at New York Comic Con that there will be something. <laughs> okay. But right now I have no idea what's going on there. It's just, it's very confusing. To me. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. So that's why I'm asking this question, but I feel like Max does just make she just again i read it as sadness uh-huh. i am always inclined to think the best of max i i recognize that this is not a great time for max right. still a little yeah, still a little sure. sore about the lying to Anne. um sure but oh, God, but but yeah. i love max so you know mm-hmm. um so yeah i do i do i read it as sadness but it could be read different ways and i guess we'll just have to just see how this story continues with max to understand yeah. Um, but yeah, it is interesting. But again, when she says, I'm your friend, that could go a lot of ways. That could be actually, I'm your friend. I mean, she does say, I will help you uh, with the challenges down the road you choose, whichever road you choose. She just says, I recognize, I want you to recognize the danger of this road. Mm-hmm. And again, she always gets sad when Eleanor pretends it's the governor doing it. Yeah. That's when she gets that look that Maybe I'm reading. That's it. She just wants just the same as Vane did. She just wants Eleanor to understand herself. Better. Maybe uh, the thing that I love that Max said to her was in the beginning of at the gallows that she explains to Eleanor that um, that NASA ceded its authority to the governor because they knew that law would restrain his authority like that. This was the bargain that was was made, basically. Okay. That NASA gave in in exchange for law because law is the opposite oh. of tyranny. Law restrains tyranny. Yes, yes. Okay. And she says that, right, that law equals predictability. Mm-hmm. She says if the bargain changes, who knows what else will change? She's already predicting when they're standing there before Vane even arrives. She's already predicting the fact that this is going to be a turning point. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So I wanted to bring up the thing that I just recently realized about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, so we have Eleanor, like, basically living in a dream world, right? She's living in a world of her own construction, like, between her story with her father and, and, like, the fact that she's pretending that this is all coming from Woods Rogers, but it's actually coming from her. She tells Woods Rogers while he's passed out. Mm-hmm. That she hopes he would understand what she did. Right. And that it was the only way she could think of to protect him. Mm-hmm. I don't really buy that. I mean, again. And there we have more of that lovely Baroque light. Right. The exactly. I just, uh, I just, but I want to bring this back to crowns. 
So, okay. you know how we've talked about how Eleanor is like suddenly this character that we really, really can get behind this whole season because she's been mm-hmm. without a crown. That Eleanor right. is potentially her best self when oh, yeah. she doesn't have but a... now Woods Rogers is down. She's in charge. Oh. Oh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's what I feel like, that this episode represents a vision back or a vision forward, but like a vision of suddenly Eleanor wearing the crown again Mm -hmm. and how this brings out her darkness. It's the same thing. Like she tells Woods Rogers the only way that she can protect him. There is some amount of truth or reason in that thinking, Mm -hmm. but it seems like just like what Flint was saying to Silver that it's actually the darkness cloaking itself in something that seems reasonable. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. So this works for me as a way to explain what she's doing here. Because otherwise, yeah. Eleanor is not being so smart. You know, Max is being super smart. Max totally sees right. the outcome that will come from hanging Bane. Right. And Eleanor is blinded by, like you, like you said, blinded by emotion. She's blinded by. Yes. But I think it's the. Vengeance and right. rage and hurt. Sure. But the fact that she, the crown is back on her head is making her more vulnerable to that. Like she has been yes. so savvy this whole season mm-hmm. in a subordinate role as Woods Rogers advisor slash partner. Right. She has been the person to be savvy about strategy. She came mm-hmm. up with the waiting for Flint on the beach. She came up. She's been right. so smart until this moment. Mm. And I had always answered it just with emotion, like just that she really wanted to kill Vane. But I know, right. but I know that she's trying to fight that. She was trying to fight doing things from the motivation of just revenge. Because she's been right. trying to not be that person for the sake of Woods Rogers. Mm -hmm. So I think just the weight of the crown has put her in a place where she is not being her best self. Yeah. she's So she told herself the story that she's not doing this for revenge. Mm -hmm. And there is Uh. and there is a tiny bit of truth or reason in that argument. Therefore, she's allowing the darkness Mm -hmm. to convince her. Wow. Yeah. No, I think that's good. I think that's I think that's the correct interpretation, in fact. (laughs) Uh. <laughs> and it works for me. I mean, I, again, it's see if we hadn't had the conversation with Flint and Silver about this very thing, I would say that what I just said is like a crazy stretch. Mm-hmm. But because it's in the context of that conversation that just happened with them, yeah. I feel like it's totally an explanation. No, I think you're right. Yet again, I find a way to be sympathetic to Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> even when again i'm most sympathetic to eleanor when she's most fucked up when she's doing the worst things this is this oh, is when i have sympathy for her okay good for you i guess <laughs> i don't know if it's good for me it just is <laughs> shall we chat about your man billy oh my gosh billy makes me so proud in this episode <laughs> he's just really coming into his own right he is coming into his own he, yeah, um, gosh, I've got this quote from him. When the world promises undesirable outcomes, only a fool believes he can alter the latter without first addressing the state of the former, which he learned from his dad. I know. Right? I love that he learned that from which his dad. Is a lovely detail. I know. Yeah, because we only hear Billy talk about himself in terms of this pirate group. Right. And so to have him carrying forth this piece of his past is really fascinating because again, I do think that he is starting to understand who he is for the first time. Absolutely. Right. And yeah. And his role. Right. Because Um, in season two, we only heard the story about Billy's parents from Flint and we knew that Billy felt shame in relation to his parents. That's right. So the fact that he's now twice brought up his parents, Mm -hmm. I feel like is like him not only finding his own, but actually integrating who he used to be like accepting allowing that version of himself back in that maybe he can like he's making peace he's making peace with with his upbringing because he's allowing and he's integrating those two selves which is something we talk about a lot exactly exactly Mm -hmm. so i that makes me happy on that level like just that that i feel like this is perhaps billy allowing himself to let go of his shame and 
and identify with his mm. parents again. Yeah, I like, I like it too. It makes me happy for mm-hmm. Billy. It does. Yep. Yep. Well, and he's the one who found our purveyor of bullshit. <laughs> yes, so, he did. <laughs> again, he is he is creating stories mm-hmm. and king making. Mm-hmm. So that's fascinating. Um, I also want to bring up what he, what he his quote of his father in relation to what Woods Rogers said about you people, like the idea oh. of changing your reality. That 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 is. That Woods Rogers, someone who is from not just from civilization, obviously Billy's parents also existed in civilization, right. but Billy's parents were people who like how I said about like about Thomas, like about Abigail Ash, mm-hmm. were people who were within civilization but trying to reform it. Yes. Okay. Whereas uh-huh. Woods Rogers is someone who's trying to enforce it. Mm, interesting. So the okay. idea that Woods Rogers would say something about you people, meaning pirates, and reshaping mm-hmm. reality in a way that's unrealistic, that that ties okay. into what Billy is quoting from, you know, political activists, mm-hmm. is really aligning again, again, I mean, you know, this isn't new news, but aligning pirates with political activism like with with fighting Mm -hmm. the good fight against civilization about the wrongs of civilization Mm -hmm. so what a neat thing for billy who is political activist and pirate to be integrating those two things and i'm really looking forward to seeing where that how that plays out yes me too absolutely okay so he said and in with that quote the reality of the world which is what you need to address is that they have embraced english rule and that nobody gives a shit no one cares. Yeah. Uh-huh. So he says, so he says to Featherstone, okay, well, you know, I need your help. Featherstone's like, let me tell you how crappy everything, like things have changed. The mm-hmm. reality on the ground, really difficult, 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 difficult. And Billy's like, okay, well, I need, I don't need to deal with that right now. I need you to help me rescue Bane. Yes. <laughs> and Featherstone's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. And then Billy says, well, I want to keep him off that ship going to England. Mm-hmm. And then it's Adele who says how she steps up. Oh, uh-huh. It's not Featherstone. It's Adele that answers and says, how do we do it? Mm, interesting. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so Billy says, we make everyone give a shit. And that's where we get to our purveyor of bullshit. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I feel I feel a tad bit bad for Jacob Garrett, except it's the perfect description of him. Well, yeah. <laughs> now it's time to talk about the jail cell again. Can I take a moment to talk about my experience of this the first time I watched it? Sure. In season three, I was watching week to week. I think most of season two and all of season three, I watched week to week. Mm -hmm. And yes, I did not expect this, but I wasn't binging then. I was week to week. And I remember, I mean, I think, you know, you kind of understand from the beginning of the episode that, you know, you have a tad bit of hope with the whole Billy storyline and the the conspiracy. I had hope. Yeah. Except when you have... That scene where you see Lambrick and Vane talking to, to each other and uh-huh. cut into it are moments that of was Vane it. on that it cart. It was the cuts. Yep. And the fact that there was no music. Right. As soon as I realized that Vane was on that cart and there was no music, I thought, he is going to die. Right. That is it. He is going, Vane is going to right. die. And it just shocked but me. But at the same moment for me, when I was watching it, the whole uh-huh. time, I'm just like, no, this can't happen. Oh God, he's going to die. Yes. No, this can't happen. And like, but it up can't. until the it moment, can't. like, because they still yeah. have hope. So like, even when he's got the noose around his neck, I don't know how they did this to I me. I still thought the crowds might like swarm him and lift him up or something. Yeah. No, I, know. I had the experience where I simultaneously was positive he was going to die. Yeah. And at the same moment had just so hope. much hope. And I still... That's a really hard set of emotions Masterfully done. to create uh-huh. in a person at the exact same. And like I was yes. feeling both of them so intensely and I will mm-hmm. never understand how that happened. But it was like, wow. I don't think I've ever had both so intensely. Like you usually are like have hope yeah. with like a little dread yeah, or you have sure dread with that, a tiny yeah. bit of hope. But I felt like they were like simultaneously such strong emotions. Mm-hmm. I, I Yeah. Sorry. So I just had to tell that story because I'm still in awe of that of experience. Yeah. That was perfect. That was the perfect yeah. set of emotions to be feeling. I think I said out loud when I, when I saw him on the cart with no music, mm-hmm. I think I said aloud, oh my God, they're going to kill Charles I Maine. did too. I 
think I did too. Yeah. <laughs> I think I said it a bunch of times. Like I kept going, no, they, yeah, no, they, just, they can't kill him. But oh I my just, God, they're going to kill him. But, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Basically. Yeah. Same experience. Uh, so let's talk about the conversation with uh, Lambert. Let's talk about the conversation. Sorry. Sorry. I've been waiting a really long time to talk about that, emo- that set of emotions. Oh, I know. I know. This is interesting because, um, of course, uh, Charles Vane is not a man of faith by right. any stretch. Yes. Yeah. So, however, I quite like his first little speech to Lambert. I do, too. Um, I actually was talking with a friend earlier this week about um, my own first confession when I was Catholic mm-hmm. as a little girl. And I only went once, one time. Mm-hmm. But my idea, even then, as like, I think I was 11 <laughs> when I first went to my first confession, uh, was just th- that it, that same idea that I have nothing to repent for with you. Hmm. Whatever remorse I have is my own. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, I'll talk straight to God or not at all. Right. Basically. Exactly. Which was excellent. I really liked that quite a lot. And and I also liked, although, of course, it was a cut on Lambrick, but that's okay because I don't like him anyway, um, that I choose not to share it with you says more about you than it does about me. Yep. That works for me. Sorry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. I don't think Lambrick has ever been held up for us as as someone who is inspiring in that way. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what he says. You are the sheep. He says, I'm a shepherd. And Charles Bain says, you are the sheep. Yep. And I think that's true of Lambrick. He has proven himself to not. I don't don't know. Uh, I don't. Yeah. He's he's a mess. Lambrick is is just not a good character. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay, I'm going to argue with that, actually. So I want to bring this conversation back to truth and not truth. Okay. So what I think in this scene is that Vane is actually the truth speaker. Obviously, he is our truth speaker. And we've had this all along. And we've had this whole, you know, we had our, our beams of light on him. Um, mm-hmm. Lambrick's not speaking the truth. Like Lambrick starts this conversation by saying, you know, I'm here to offer you solace, to offer you, to offer you comfort. But he so quickly goes to sneering at him and saying what a horrible person uh he is. Sure, sure, yeah. He is not speaking the truth. He did not come in Mm -hmm. here with honest intentions. Right. Yeah. He was playing the part. Interesting. Right. Uh And so this made me kind of rethink his whole thing. That kind of works as, you know, he's just not mostly for your sake, but I'm sad that we were not given an example of a person of faith who is mm. an honorable, righteous person. Yeah. Thank you. He's never been anything but a person who's doing the motions, but not having Posturing. the content. Yeah. Absolutely. The spiritual depth is, has never yeah. been there. He's never been speaking mm-hmm. the truth. Right. Even as he sees it. Sure. Right. So I think that this scene makes that clear, especially juxtaposed yeah. with someone like Vane. Yes. Uh-huh. Who sure. is what he is, but he's honest yeah. about it. But he is honest about it. He stands by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Has much more integrity than that. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A whole lot more. So, yes. So that's that's what I feel about it. Um yeah, Lambert never came in, never went into that cell to actually offer mercy. I think you're right. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. You ready? Yeah, we're there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, this is hard to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, where are we going to start? Do you want to start with... Um, let's start with Billy. Billy. Yeah. I think Billy in the crowd is really lovely. Looking for the right moment, looking for the right opportunity, Mm -hmm. trying to orchestrate this thing that he must know. I mean, if not impossible, is certainly improbable. Right. The odds are not in their favor. Right. And he's willing to risk himself. Like he was going to go up there and basically try to convince the crowd to side with him, which was would be a very dangerous place for him to be. Mm hmm. Um, my, my favorite thing in this episode, an episode full of things I adore. Okay. Maybe, yes. maybe I like the two anchor thing better. I don't know. That's hard. But the, <laughs> it is hard. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, this, yeah, it's, this is a crazy episode. Just like the saddest episode. And yet it has so many things that really touch me very dearly. 
Mm-hmm. When Billy is looking at Vane and then Vane looks back at him and you keep go- you go back and forth between them and Billy's trying to read Vane's intent. And yes. and then there's when Vane shakes him off. Like that's that's I feel like the thing that people focus that on. Of the head it was amazing. It is amazing, uh-huh. but for me it's the whole eye contact. It's the whole Yes. It's just the level of understanding between these two. And they've not interacted mm-hmm. Since the no. end of season two, when they were at God, odds, not, right? Yeah, sure. Uh huh. And yet, even yeah. back then, there was an established thing that they that they were not tied to exact each other exactly, but tied tied in their integrity. I guess. Yeah. They sure. had enough of a common core that mm-hmm. they were automatically connected to each other in a way, even though they were at odds with each other. And I feel like that those conversations made this moment possible mm. where Billy could look at Vane and so understand, like they're just the level of understanding between the two of them. Yeah. I just, I don't know. It's just, it's so moving to me. It's really so moving yeah. to me. I mean, it's tied of course with Vane's sacrifice, which is, you know, amazing. I mean, yes. in hindsight, when you look at Vane's whole trajectory, The idea, you know, we watched him become a strategic thinker and a big picture Mm -hmm. person and we kept talking about it. And it's been this process that's been going on for many episodes that it ends in him sacrificing his life for the big picture Mm -hmm. in the process of speak the truth. Yes. Yeah. Which is a great. What do you think about his speech there at the end? Oh, my God. I love his speech in the end. Um, you, I love you it probably too. want more, more, more specifics than I love no, it. But, no, well, that's okay. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Of course. Yeah. Um, um, and, and of course there's that callback. They mean to make us monsters. Um, he, he didn't say that, but I just mean, that's, right. That's yeah, yeah, the... absolutely. Well, that's the thing is that it's so, yes. it's so tied. Like, like I said, in the beginning of this episode, it's so tied to what Flint was doing in, remember in season, at the end of season two, we were talking about how. Vane and Flint had kind of intersected like that one was thinking about himself and the other uh was the was the big picture thinker but yeah yeah. Vane has now surpassed Flint as being the person with the idea of the big picture because Flint when he was a condemned man Mm -hmm. he was speaking from revenge he was speaking for himself he sure was yep and for Miranda Mm -hmm. and for Thomas Vane is not speaking from revenge no, there is you're no right. the man who existed mm-hmm. only for short term goals and vengeance once. Yes. Uh huh. He is making a pure sacrifice. He there is mm-hmm. not a note of vengeance in his voice. He is oh, only so right. yep. speaking to help other people become what they need to be. Mm-hmm. That's good. It's, I mean, yep. it's shocking. I, <laughs> again, yep. again. Well, and he also uses his own very honest language. Yes. Because he says, the voice that refuses to be enslaved. Yep. And we know how he feels about his slavery. Yes, we do. Once lived in you and may yet still. We are many, they are few. Yeah. Oof, that's a good speech. I know. It's a very good speech. Yeah. And then Billy, it was the only way to start it. Uh, and it's amazing that Billy understands him. I love that Billy understands him. Yep, I do too. I agree. Okay, so the thing I want to bring up, which I thought is interesting for the whole season about his speech, is that, right, so we talked about voices, and that was in this episode and in past episodes. But he says, they brought you here to show you death, to frighten you into ignoring that voice. Oh, uh uh-huh. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. you know, death has literally been a character in this season. Yes, that's right. Uh Uh-huh. Probably going to have the exact same thing we had last week where I say, I'm not sure what how this all connects. And then a week from now, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I figured it out. (laughs) Yeah. Uh I don't really know how this connects, but I feel like the fact that he brought up death specifically Mm-hmm. I just need some more time. I'm going to take another week to like yeah. think about the role of death in this season. Yeah, and the fear of death. I mean, because and the avoidance of exactly. death, exactly. Embrace of it, right? And how death maybe mm-hmm. silences us. Like Flint's whole dream series, where he was, where he was uh, tempted by death, 
was what was keeping uh-huh. him from action. It's when he set that aside that he right. that he went that into true. action with the queen okay. with his rousing uh-huh. speech and his idea of this coalition. Mm-hmm. I'm just I'm trying to make sense of this. Like we had death in the yeah. very first episode. That's when we had that play. Yes. With the character mm-hmm. of death or the person dressed up as death. Right. And then we had the actual character of death. Mm-hmm. We've had people, you know, a lot of revelations happened during the doldrums when they were on the verge of death. Right. Okay. And now we have Vane specifically calling that out. It's just, he, you know, those words were chosen for a reason. Of course they were. You yeah, know what absolutely. I mean? Like, yeah. he could have said they came to show subjugation. There are just a lot of words that he could have ended up using for why this hanging was happening. And he said, they're yeah. showing you death. Hmm. So let's, let's mull that over and let's revisit yeah. that next week. We'll that. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's just really interesting. He says to fear death is a choice. Well, he also says, you know, what is it? He says, uh, get on with it, motherfucker. What does he say? <laughs> Get on with so it, like, motherfucker. First of all, he, he calls that also made Sarah really happy. Yeah, she and I both were pretty thrilled. Right, he calls on the beginning of his own death. Like he says, mm-hmm. start it. So he's putting, he's showing control. Okay, uh huh. But then he further shows control by when the cart starts moving. He actually walks off of it. Yes. Yes, he does. So he says to fear death is a choice and then shows mm-hmm. them himself embracing death. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep, that's good. Ah, oh, gosh, it's such a powerful scene. Yeah, I know. It's a, yeah. And they hold on him so long with the twitching. Mm. I know. And again, there's no music. No, right. <sighs> no, it's horrifying. It is horrifying. It's. It was actually very... It, I, it felt very real. Like mm-hmm. people used to just gather around to watch men hang. Yeah. And people used to I do the know. thing that, that Billy, when he tells them to go pull on him, to, yes. that was also a thing yes. that was, was a real to thing. speed up the yeah. process. Mm-hmm. Very disturbing. Yeah. And beautiful. Mm-hmm. And beautiful. From a storytelling perspective, obviously. Yes. No, of course. Yeah. This is, Billy's right. This was the only thing that could have done it. It's the only way. This was the only way to start it. Yep. Right. And not everyone could have made that sacrifice and not everyone's name meant it enough right. to make that sacrifice worthwhile. Right. And this is exactly the thing we've been calling since season two when Vane didn't want Flint symbolically to hang and Flint didn't want oh, Vane yes. symbolically to hang. We yeah. know that both of them always understood the power of something like this. Yes. Mm. So that Vane chose it for the sake mm-hmm. of that power is really incredible. It is. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so we have two things I want to bring up quickly afterwards. It's, okay. it's really hard to talk about anything after the scene. The I'll be your Charles Vane is actually after this. Right. It is. Uh huh. Um, so I like that Eleanor uh, is explaining to Chamberlain that he needs extra forces because Flint has completely maneuvered this whole scenario and that yes. she says he uh-huh. wants she's really great right. here. she is really great she, she says he mm-hmm. wants the force you bring to bear yes mm-hmm. so cool. it is so cool but the last thing we see is teach teach yeah i want to remind everyone of the first time we see teach because this is Mm -hmm. very similar to that it is very similar yeah seeing him from the back seeing him from the back seeing someone come up and talk to him what from the back but what's interesting is the difference is that we don't see his Mm -hmm. eyes in a mirror Uh he is not poised he is not glib Oh. We go on to see his full, well, his face in shadow, but we we pan around yeah. to actually see his face without the mm-hmm. protection of looking through a mirror. Yeah. And, and yeah, he's fucking terrifying. <laughs> like, yeah. Rem- mm-hmm. Remember when you, Don't want him on your yeah, bad remember side. when you talked about folksy teach <laughs> in the beginning? <laughs> this is not folksy teach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just, it makes me, I'm really geared up for the finale. I know, man. I'm so excited. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a gorgeous thing. Yep. A spectacle to be. Before that, we need to raise a glass to Vane, to Charles. That's right. Our dear, our dear Charles, 
It was a great road I with you. 14. So pleased to have my good scotch tonight. Yes. In uh, just a few days, we get to talk about the season finale, and I'm so excited. Mm-hmm. I think I will go watch it right now. Well, you do you, Daddy. <laughs> okay. I can't say I blame you. Okay, but first, we have thesis statements. Ready to guns! Full compliment! Okay. All right, Liz. What is your thesis statement? I don't have the proper statement, a thesis statement. I think the thesis is about that idea of emotions clouding your judgment. So I guess I would have to say it's that line that Flint says about it cloaking itself and whatever Mm -hmm. it needs to to compel you to action. I think you're right. I was going to go with maybe with Billy's thing, but I think it's that actually now that we've talked about everything. Okay, give me a sec. I'll find it. It is. That's what it does. It cloaks itself in whatever it must to move you into action. Hmm. Do you yep. feel good about this? It's so good. I feel really good about it. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Cloaks itself. Uh huh. All right. Thesis statement done. Sorry, I was going to predict that next week's thesis statement is going to be like so easy. <laughs> oh yeah, obviously. I can tell you what it is right now. Exactly. Yep. But that's okay. <laughs> but we won't. We won't. We're going to make. But you I do all... want to know. Uh, let's see. Well, you already talked about your favorite part then. That that look between Billy and Vane. <laughs> that is, is that what, what you want to well, keep with. Oh. And the two anchors. Yeah. Can I do both of them? Because that two anchor thing. You can do both of them because mine is going to be really vague this this week. I even made my daughter watch the two anchor thing and explained all the strategy and the like. Oh, that's hysterical. (laughs) And she was like, she was like, mom, are you sure you want to show me something from black sales? I was like, no, no, you can watch this. This this part's okay. This part's okay. (laughs) This isn't pretty dresses and it's also not scary. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, well, I'm going to say that my favorite part, uh, uh, again, it's going to be very vague and a broad, I'm going to paint with a broad stroke, but is the aesthetics of this particular Mm -hmm. episode. Um, because we got some great ship stuff, of course, the Mm -hmm. two anchor scene was amazing. Um, that Baroque light coming through the windows was extraordinary. Um, the details in the costuming between, uh, that great green color that we talked about with Mm -hmm. Eleanor, the coat for, you know, sexiest silver we've gotten so far. Uh, (laughs) I think I said hot. Anyway, same difference. (laughs) Uh, yeah, that's fine. Excited to talk to you, Luke. Uh, so, (laughs) um, and then, oh, uh, Max, her jewelry, did you notice yes, in that episode, was yes. very like native looking jewelry mm-hmm. from the island, which I really appreciated. I thought that was a really nice touch. No, and it was very so, colorful, which is not always uh-huh. the case. Like usually she's got a lot of metal going on and yes. this is all very colorful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so just the, the look of this episode. Okay. Well, I have to admit something. In our last thesis statement game, I feel like somebody got it. I searched our Twitter so many times to try to figure it out. Oh. And I didn't find that person. So if you got last week's oh, no. correct, please uh-huh. retweet it to us so yeah. that we and we will give you your proper due okay. next week. And I feel re- doubly bad about this because we just now got organized. We Thank just you. got our Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you, Captain O'Shandy. Captain O'Shandy. Yes, for it. making us an actual spreadsheet so that we can keep mm-hmm. track of things. And when she did that, she realized that we had missed two people. So <gasps> two people. Two oh, people. No. One of them being her. So Uh oh. Yep. Captain sorry, O'Shandy. Captain Does she get another effing ship? Well, she gets two, because I told her she gets an extra ship for having done the spreadsheet. And extra ship for the spreadsheet. Well, she did okay. give up the manatee though. She gave the manatee back. So she needs two oh, ships. Oh, she gave it back. Yes. To, okay. She needs two ships so that she can have a fleet. Two ships so she has a fleet. Excellent. So what's the one she's got so far? You don't even know. No, Heaven I do. Knows. It's on the spreadsheet. I can look it up. It's on the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what? In the meantime, we owe Chumbucket Charlie a ship. Chumbucket Charlie gets a ship? Yep. Oh, Chumbucket man. Charlie didn't even, was sweet enough not even to complain, but was supposed to be oh. a captain and wow. gets a ship. Wow. Yep. Okay. Okay. So you so work on Chumbuck that and, and I'll look made up. captain. Yeah. Because I knew that, that she had at least one promotion before. Mm-hmm. So, okay. I said she. It might be he. I don't know everybody on Twitter very well. Okay. So Chumbucket Charlie um, gets... The sea urchin. How about that? All right. The sea urchin. That's fabulous. And Uh Captain Sue O'Shandy has the sterling. 
because she gave up the manatee. Oh, the sterling, right? Because she's Silver Sue. Right. Okay. So she needs two so more. Silver Sue O'Shandy gets the sterling. Oh, you want to do the... medals or you want to do jewelry terms? I think jewelry terms in general because I was thinking. Um, oh, so I want one to be the tourmaline. The tourmaline is perfect. Yes, the tourmaline. Very good. Uh, and another one would oh, be. Oh, the diamond. The black diamond. <gasps> perfect. Black Nailed diamond it. and the tourmaline. <laughs> Wow, I named a ship. This is the first time I've named a you ship. You did. Congratulations. <laughs> yep. Hooray. Okay, so I think we're done. Uh, just want to remind everyone that we do have Father Steep jewelry. We do, and it's amazing and gorgeous, and you need it in your life. I know. I'm actually sending you some tomorrow. <gasps> I'm so excited. <laughs> wow. That's exciting. Okay. And um, so Christmas. that link will be in the show notes. And okay. it's DaphneOlive.com and you go to the Fathom Steep page. Mm-hmm. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that wraps us up. Thank you so much again for joining us. We always have such a great time here. Yes. And uh, we're very excited to bring you Luke Arnold in the near future. So do stay tuned. Yep. Until then, from Common Room Radio, I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. I love this scene. More scotch here. Okay, let's each pour ourselves some more great scotch. Great sound. Are you on glass three? That's all right. I'm not judging. <laughs> We just there's just too many potential outtakes in this episode. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm on glass three. No judging. No judging. No judging. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We're very excited. So Luke, if you're listening, hi. Hi. We'll be Daphne talking like we'll to be talk- on camera. You're gonna love it. <laughs> <laughs> you're blushing so deeply. <laughs> okay. He's met me. I didn't strip. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Well, that's because you weren't podcasting, darling. God. (laughs) Why do you do this to me every week, Liz? Because it's so much fun. (laughs) Okay, that's going in outtake. That's not going in the body of the episode. Okay. (laughs) I'm an amazing mark. (laughs) (laughs) Thank goodness I don't live in Nassau because I would be totally, uh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> they would get all the information out of me, huh? <laughs> oh, good. Oh, I'm glad dear. I have an outtake now to go after this sadness that will be the end of this episode. There you go. Yep. <laughs> okay.